You may be seated. Thank you so much. Worship, worship, worship team. Good job today. Good job. Well, over the city, welcome uh, to our 11 a.m. service. And if this is your first time in our worship service, we're glad that you're here today. Amen? Would you say hi to that person right next to you? Come on, just say hi. Awesome. Wow. This is so amazing. And we have our Alaska team here. Steve and Mona and uh, Elijah. Uh, that's, they're one of our team members, the church planting team members in our Alaska campus. So glad that they're here today because our campus pastors just got married last night. And are they here? Woo! How are you guys? How are you guys? <laughs> uh, okay, okay, we understand. We understand. Okay. <laughs> and uh, just want to welcome those who are uh, online uh, service. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, wherever you are in this part of the world, thank you for being part of the Hope of the City family, right? And uh, we're so glad. Keep inviting your friends and sharing our uh, worship services so that many would, you know, hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, after the service, you know, I encourage you, congratulate the newlywed. Okay. And uh, they still receive uh, gifts, by the way, but they only receive cash. So uh, is that good? <laughs> it's for our Alaska campus. <laughs> oh, there's another couple who just got married. Uh, how many weeks ago? A month ago. That's she's my daughter, Phoebe, and my son-in-law. Uh, Brandon. So they're part of the Alaska team as well. So uh, they just moved to Alaska. They are here for the wedding and they're moving back to Alaska after the service today. So uh, please uh, pray for them. Pray for our Alaska campus that number one prayer request is that God will give us the permanent place for worship. Because we are launching our campus there in three months. So uh, pray that God will give them wisdom and that, you know, the Lord will bless us with uh, a place, a permanent place to launch our church. Today, I'm so excited because we have a special guest all the way from Florida. <laughs> from the Sunshine uh, County now to uh, Evergreen County. Uh, is that right? <laughs> so, full of rain. Dr. Alan Eller is, uh, you know, one of the closest uh, friends that we have in our lives uh, when we started uh, here in Seattle. And Dr. Alan became my professor at Northwest University. And uh, uh, thank God for all the things that I learned from his class. And uh, I have something to admit to you. I failed his class because, you know, when you are, okay, talking about Filipino, right? Oh, uh, uh, we, we were, I, I was overwhelmed, okay? I was overwhelmed with the, uh, the requirements at, you know, a master level class. So I was good. I was attending the class, but I didn't finish it. And Dr. Allen kept on encouraging me, Luis, just submit any paper. I will pass you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I just let it go away. I said, Dr. Allen, it's okay. Thank you for your generosity. <laughs> so I got an F. I was be I'm just being honest with you guys. But Dr. Allen is so generous. He's trying to make me pass. But it's me. And sometimes that's the problem with that. I'm not preaching, but, uh, but you know, I took that class again, that coaching class again, this time with Dr. Uh, Don Dietrich and uh, Do uh, Jody, and this time I got an A. <laughs> Woo! 
Yes. <laughs> it's it's the class about uh, the subject is about coaching and coaching, right, Pastor Allen? So, and today, uh, Dr. Allen and Kira. Uh, they moved to uh, Florida, and Dr. Allen serves as the dean of uh, Southeastern University. And if there's any student here who wants to move to Florida, that's the place to go. All right? And, uh, and I believe the Lord prepared Dr. Allen here to share with us today. And maybe uh, Kira can say hi to all of us before Pastor Allen would share, bring the word. Let's welcome mm. Pastor Alan and Kira. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Luis and Pastor Ruth. So good to be with you, and I'll give Kira a chance to greet everyone. Well, this was unexpected. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you all are beautiful. I, I love the family of God. And wherever we go, it's always beautiful. Mm. And, and thank you for being reflections of him, and thank you for allowing us to be with you today. And we love and bless your pastors. You all are very, very blessed. And we're excited about the Alaska campus. Mm -hmm. Amen. And Amen. everything That's exciting. that God is going to do mm -hmm. there. And you may not see the building yet. God already knows where that building mm -hmm. is. And, right. and he's got it waiting for you. That's right. So. That's right. Right. Thank you. Right. Well, and it's so good to be back at Hope of the City. Nine years ago, right before I left Northwest to go, we left Northwest to go to Southeastern. Got to join you over at the mall, at South Center Mall. I don't know if anybody but part of those days back there when you were doing all that, and it was it's so exciting, and you are so blessed with your pastors. I remember when we were pastoring up north of Everett, it was called Warren Beach Community Church, now called Life Church 360. We actually had the privilege of being there for a funeral yesterday on the 22nd anniversary of me being pastor there, starting my very first Sunday. But I just remember being pastors and hearing about the launch of Hope of the City, and seeing all of the things that God has done through you and through your leadership, getting ready to go to the next era, the next level. And it is such a joy and an honor. Ran into pastors uh, Ruth and Luis at the CMN conference along with uh, uh, James and Sharon Reyes, pastors of Charisma, and we're dear friends, and we just were talking, and, and Pastor Luis said, can you come and speak sometime? I'm like, well, I'll actually be there, because I hear my role has shifted a bit. After eight years of being dean, I've also served as professor, and now I'm doing more church networking, but I still oversee the program, similar program at Southeastern that, that Pastor Luis was part of at Northwest, and he, these are pastors from all over the country, and their final session they did on Orcas Island, Washington, at the home of Leonard Sweet. I don't know if you've ever read any of his books. He's, he's called a semiotician, always looking for the signs to see what God is up to in the world and how we can be a part of that. And it was an incredible finish to them. So we put them on the plane yesterday and then went, went back to Warren Beach. And now it is a joy to be with you here today. And uh, we're going to take a look through John chapter 9. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to take it out and turn there. And as we start, I just want to ask you a question. You ever had a trouble? Anybody ever had trouble? Anybody ever had problems? Anybody have problems in your life right now? Okay, you know, there's two different ways you can look at your problems. Actually, there's probably a lot more than that, but we're going to focus on two. And the question is, are you going to look at the blame? Who are you going to blame for your problem? Or are you going to see your problem as an opportunity? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, thank you so much for the incredible things you're doing at Hope of the City and, and for what you're going to do in the future. And Lord, I pray that, that you would just see that group going to Anchorage with more fruit than any of us can imagine of lives, finding you as Savior and Lord, of your Holy Spirit setting people free. And Father, would you set people free here today? Would you speak through your words? Help us, Lord God, to just see our lives in a new way as we understand things that we think hold us back. Maybe your opportunity to move us to a new level. And I pray, Lord, that that would happen in the lives of every listener you would speak to us be glorified in jesus name and we all said amen amen john chapter 9 verse 1 as he went along he saw a man blind from birth as jesus passed by some translations say he saw a man blind from birth whatever you think your problem is can you imagine being blind from the time you were born you know, I mean, problems happen. We, 
I, I, Southeastern is, is, has been an incredible experience. I loved our time at Northwest, but Southeastern is just kind of at another level. Almost 10,000 students this fall, 200 sites across the country, and we've seen just incredible growth, great things happening. And, and yes, it is sunny and warm this time of year, 85 degrees when we got on the plane on Saturday last week and things like that. So it's, it's nice. The campus is beautiful. And we live, it's about a 20 to 30, depending on traffic, drive uh, from my campus to our house. And so I was going down this street that I always go down it's two lanes, and you know, you see just eventually it merges, but you kind of go along. But you know, you ever go around the corner and you, the street you take every day, and all of a sudden traffic is backed way back. We wonder, okay, what's going on here? Things are slow. And I notice the left lane is further back than the right lane. What would you do? Get in the right lane, right? I mean, it's shorter. Well, that one not being a great decision that day because the right lane was slower because there was a car that was stalled there and a police light and everything. So everybody had to merge back to the left lane. And by the time I realized that, we were stuck. I was blocked in. Cars were at least a half a mile back on that other lane. And what do you do? You look for a chance to enter into the traffic, right? And you look for that. Somebody being nice. And, and you interpret a gap in the traffic as maybe somebody being nice that you're going to be able, he's letting you in. And that's what it looked like. Big pickup truck, nice gap. I'm going to slide in there. And so I started to slide in the lane and all of a sudden, wham, right behind the driver's seat, that pickup just slammed right into my car. And I mean, I could barely open my door. There was no way I was opening up the door of the passenger seat. I mean, behind me, the back seat right behind me. And so he means, I didn't see you. And I'm like, well, it was right here. I don't know how you didn't see me, but obviously there was problems. His truck wasn't in too bad a shape. My car was not in great shape. So we decided to pull over there behind the other car that was stalled in the right lane and had to deal with all that stuff and talk to the police officer and and they said, well, you don't really need a report. Just file your insurance. And I'm thinking, okay, what's this going to do to my insurance premiums? All those kinds of things. And, but, but we worked with USAA because I used to be in the Air Force. And okay, they great. They will take care of that. And they gave us a rental car and shipped our car in to get it fixed up. So we're in the rental car. And I had to go to another conference out of state. And my daughter has been teaching English in Japan since she graduated from Northwest in 2013. But she's back with us for a short time. And so we want to get as much time with her as we can. So my my wife, Kira, and our daughter, Hannah, were going off to a museum and see some things, and they were driving down the road in the rental car, and a truck launched a rock that hit the windshield and cracked, almost shattered the windshield. I mean, this is like two days after we had the car there. It's like double trouble. This is not fair. But whatever trouble I thought I had, thank God we had insurance. Thank God our car got fixed. Okay, my premium's a little bit more. I had to pay the deductible twice. But you know what? Things could be a lot worse. I could have been born blind. I mean, imagine what that would be like, never having seen anything. Your whole life is just determined by him. He gets called this over and over again. It is his identity. People knew him as the man born blind. No way of, of working a job. He was a beggar. That was his job we see later on down in chapter 9. No hope of being on his own. And we'll see later his parents even disown him. I mean, this is a horrible situation all the way around. And, and you know, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, we see in verse 2, ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And they ask a question that assumes there's somebody to blame for the problem. And you know, when you find yourself in trouble, do you ever point the finger at somebody? Do you ever make it your goal to figure out who's going to blame, be blamed for your problem, your situation? Now, now, it's the natural thing. And sometimes if there's a systemic problem that occurs over and over and over again, you know, you need to fix it. You need to figure out what's going on to get it fixed. And, and, and there's things that happen that way. But quite often, people love to get into a blame mentality on something for which there is nothing to blame. And that was the case right here, as we'll see what Jesus said. And the problem is, when we get caught up in a blame mentality, sometimes we use that to make justify ourselves. I'm going to be vindicated because it's your fault I am this way. But, but you know what? The problem, it doesn't change the situation. We continue to deal with all of these things, and we just assume that we will always be dealing with this current problem. We blame others, and we make ourselves the victim. And as long as I'm the victim, I don't have to change. All I have to do is point my finger and say, it's their fault I am the way I am, and life is horrible, and it's your fault. 
But notice, it's not just somebody else's fault the disciples are asking about. Whose fault is it? This man's? Some of us are wired the other way. We're not pointing the finger at others. We point the fingers at ourselves. And we blame ourselves from our situations. And sometimes we blame ourselves for things that aren't our fault. And, but what happens is it puts in, 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 in our minds this idea that we can never succeed, that we are doomed to failure. So why even try? I know it's going to come out horrible. I'm so worthless. I'm a worthless human being. I'm not even going to get out of bed this morning. You know, we can kind of get into this mentality. And both of these, whether we blame others or we blame ourselves, we will find ourselves imprisoned. And the problem will remain and the problem will define us. But people, the problem you face does not have to define you. Instead, you need to change your mindset. And that's what Jesus does in verse three. He says, neither this man nor his parents sin. In other words, blame is not the game. Blame is not the point. That's not the thing. But this happened, and I love these words, so that the works of God might be displayed in him so that the works of God, and you know, you don't see a miracle unless there's something that needs to be changed or transformed. Anybody ever seen somebody miraculously healed or maybe yourselves have been miraculously healed? You know what? When there is no other explanation for it, that shows that it had to be God. The doctors can't explain it. My own father almost lost his eyesight, had a hole in his retina. Doctors had never, ever been able to find a way to deal with sealing up a retina hole, and they only grow worse, worse, and worse. And this happened when I was pastoring over 15 years ago, that's 17 years ago now. And yet, he prayed, we prayed, his church prayed. He showed up for the surgery and they did a test before they did the surgery. And they said, we don't know how, but that hole is sealed up. And to this day, 17 years later, my 91-year-old father has full use of both eyes. There's no other explanation for this except that the works of God are displayed in him. And this, I love this Greek word. I don't know if you guys like to learn Greek this morning. Want to learn a word? Okay, say it with me. Phanerothe. Fanerothe. And it means, fanero means to just show. It's like you're going to put on a big show. It's like whew, something there. It's like, like the magician. He pulls the curtain, whew, and there it is. Wow. And you just see this. Wow. And this is what happened. And, and so just think about it. What this man and the disciples saw as a problem, that they wanted to find someone to blame, Jesus saw as an opportunity to demonstrate the works of God. And, and it, sometimes we just need to have a mentality change. And when we realize that God's work are, is revealed, when people can see what God is doing, several things happen. One of those is God is glorified because God himself is the only one who could do what has happened. Another thing that happens is the problem itself is solved. My dad's sight is restored. You, we've been healed. You've restored. You get that miracle job offer, financial blessing, whatever it is. It, there's, the situation is resolved. Things are changed. Things are better because of it. And when you celebrate what God has done, when you let God's work be seen in you, when you talk about and give God glory about what he's done for you, he will build faith in others because they will see and understand that God who did that for you, can he do this for me? And the answer is yes. Well, as I said, when we were pastoring at Warren Beach from 2000 to 2008, there was a, a, a younger man who started coming to our church who had had a really rough life situation. His aunt was the longest attending person of our church, been coming since the 1950s. And Tony had had some rough stuff. He'd gotten involved in some drugs and some gang stuff and things like that. But he'd come back to Jesus while he's at the church. But he had two boys who were young teens at the time. And they would come sometimes. And they would start to make steps towards Jesus. And then they would get caught up in following the path of their dad. And unfortunately, the younger one of those boys, Levi, died because of resulting overdose of drugs and things like that just a couple years ago. And it was heartbreaking for us because we knew him and we had loved him. But fortunately, his older brother, AJ, has another story. And I saw this come up on Facebook just last fall. In fact, November 29th. Today, I celebrate three years clean and sober. 
Today, I celebrate the day I came to Mountain Ministries and had my life completely transformed and flipped upside down from what I used to be. Today, I am no longer walking in addiction, chasing needles, heroin, or meth. Today, I am loved, I am cherished, and I am a child of the living God. He who has restored me, he made me new. He set my feet upon the rock, and I'm here to tell you, if you are struggling and need help, he can do it for you too. He will give you a new life. He will transform you. He will do a wonderful work in you if you let him. Don't be afraid to reach out. He is always with you, wanting for you to take that step. You see, AJ got to experience what had always been a a problem that had defined his life. The opportunity that happened when Jesus passed by and he accepted Jesus' work in his life and he found freedom, but he didn't just let that freedom sit there for him. He shared it with all of his friends so that others who had taken that same pathway could come to find the freedom that only Jesus can bring. And see, we just need to open our eyes and recognize opportunities when they come. You know, and and I wouldn't say this is a Jesus opportunity, but if you see the nice parking space that Pastor Luis reserved for us out front, that's not our car. We happened to return the vans at the airport car rental just up the road here yesterday afternoon. And, um, you know, we didn't need to drive big vans all over the place until we fly out this evening. But they pointed, okay, you can pick one of those cars. And we looked, they had a Dodge Challenger. It's like, oh, wow, okay, we would never buy a car like this, but to drive one for two days, we'll take advantage of that opportunity. (laughs) You know, okay, that was fun. You know, that's there. So Kira got to drive back while I was grading papers in the car yesterday and found out, okay, this is a little more car than we're used to. But you know, you look at those opportunities and when God does something for you, you let his work be seen in you. Others will see and they will respond because we live in a world that is tainted by sin. You know, we're coming out of this COVID pandemic, but you know, as bad as that's been, there's a far worse pandemic that has plagued all of humanity since the beginning of creation. Since our very first forefathers chose to disobey God, we ushered in this pandemic of this three-letter word called sin. And the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It has infected every single one of us. And there is only one cure, only one vaccine, and it is guaranteed to bring healing and freedom. And that is Jesus himself who came and died on the cross for us. But in the meantime, we live in a world that is still infected with sin. And even once we've experienced his freedom and forgiveness, there are still these things that will come our way. But the chance is, the choice is to us, what will we do about it? Jesus says in verse four, as long as it is day, as long as it is day. In other words, there's an opportunity we have now that we may not have later. And notice his next word there, that little two-letter word. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. We. This wasn't just Jesus' mission. This was all people's, all of his followers. He was speaking to his disciples. And and sometimes we can get caught up in a mentality that says, well, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it himself. When in reality, the opportunities that Jesus gives to us are a partnership. Us and Jesus together, we must do the works. It is we, the body of Christ. It is we, Hope of the City Church. We together are doing it with God's help. And it takes both Jesus passing by. It takes doing it while it is still light, while it is still day. But we must do our part to recognize those opportunities that come disguised as problems. In World War I, there was a British doctor named Alexander Fleming who was out and recognizing that the way they were treating the the millions of soldiers who were wounded on the battlefield was only causing infection to go worse. They used this stuff called a septic. And what it would do, it would get rid of the infection on the surface of the skin, but it wouldn't treat the, the, the infection lower in the skin. And the problem is it was actually healthy stuff on the top and the poisonous stuff was down below. So people were actually dying and it was going worse than it was supposed to. And he tried and he looked at that and he recognized this problem, but he didn't stop. And even after the war was over, he kept researching a way. Could there be a way that we deal with that core of the deep, deep infection? And he was working at St. Mercy's Hospital. And while he was there, he had a a partner who was working with V.D. Allison who had made fun of him because V.D. Allison was always perfectly clean. All his dishes were clean and you were always messy. And he later on reflected, he said, you know, if... 
If Fleming had been as tidy as I would, he never would have discovered his greatest discovery. Because one night on September 3rd, 1926, Fleming had returned to his laboratory after spending a weekend with his family in Suffolk, England. And as he came back, he was looking at the plates and he noticed that there was one that had experienced, it was filled with infection and experienced a little bit of healing around the outside. So he went and he took a look at it. What was it that had brought that healing? What was it there? And then he, when he figured it out, he said these words that he's known for to this day. That's funny. That's funny. He discovered lysozyme, which has the Latin word penicillium, which is the source of penicillin today. And Alexander Fleming has now gone on record as making the number one medical discovery of the 20th century and becoming one of the top known Scotsmen of all time because he took a problem and said, there's gotta be more here. And solving the problem of just skin infection has led to antibiotics that have solved so many diseases around the world because of that. So what's your problem? Are you going to let it stay a problem? Are you going to focus at blaming others? Are you going to see your problem as an opportunity to show the works of God? Things can happen there, but we have to recognize the timing. Jesus said in verse five, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And this is an imagery for the Feast of Tabernacles that was taking place. And that comes, if you're familiar with the book of Exodus and the story is they, the Israelites were leaving Egypt and they wanted to know where to go. God would show them in a pillar of fire by day, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that light was always used as part of the Feast of Tabernacles to remind people to be led by God, to seek God's leadership and guidance and direction in what they were doing. And, and this whole metaphor Jesus is giving there is this idea of timing that we have this day, time, and the season. It's kind of like surfing. I don't know if any surfers are out there. You know, you got to catch the wave at the right time if you're going to be able to ride it in. Like the Beach Boys say, catch a wave and you're sitting on top of the world, right? You know, but, but if you wait too long, the wave's going to blow you by. Get up too soon, the wave's going to pummel you into the sand, you know, there's something about the timing and we need to recognize and we need to take action. And the whole point of this thing, we must do the works of God. Uh, there's something about this that we need to do and be a part of. And the, even the case for this blind man, verse seven, verse six and seven. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Right, now, think about that. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I mean, this is Jesus, God incarnate. He called Lazarus up from the dead by just saying, Lazarus, come forth. That's all he had to do. Why did he have to make mud to cover this man's eyes? You know, a lot of scholars have speculated on this, and even the early church fathers have said, well, you know, God, when he created man, he created him out of the dust of the earth. So he's filling in some of the missing pieces. Maybe that was the case. But one way or another, this man's healing was not complete until he did his part. It isn't that Jesus couldn't have done it all himself. We don't get to know the why, but what we do get to know is this man's healing was not complete until he got up and he went to the pool of Siloam and he washed. And some of us, we're people of faith, but we're waiting for God to solve our problem. And God's waiting for us to get up and go to the pool of Siloam, whatever our pool of Siloam is. And there are others who would say, well, you know what? It's only up to me. Well, that's not true either. Because this man could have gone to the pool of Siloam and he wouldn't have experienced the healing if it hadn't have been for Jesus putting the mud on his eyes. It takes both. And our part isn't always easy. I mean, can you imagine wearing mud on your eyes and walking down the street trying to figure out, where am I going? Where is this? Where is this? Here. That wasn't easy. And you're a part of doing what God is calling you to do to see your breakthrough and your Jesus opportunity may not be easy. You people going to Anchorage, it's cold up there right? It's not going to be easy. And if you think it's going to be easy, you got another thing coming, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be incredible because this is the Jesus opportunity. He's setting you apart for that. And if you do your part and he does his part, the light is shining. The world is going to change and be transformed like it was for this man.
And we go on and we read that the man went and he came back seeing. He came back seeing. You know, think about all the miracles that Jesus did that required somebody to do something. John 5, take up your mat and go home. Healing didn't come until he took up. The, 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 the lepers, the 10 lepers, show yourselves to the priests. We need to do our part. When John Onwachekwa on, on moved to Atlanta over a decade ago, he went to plant a church. But he went to a neighborhood that had historically been a very rough African-American part of the city, riddled with gang activity and drugs. But things were changing as they are in a lot of cities across America. People no longer want to commute from the suburbs who are young and, and up and coming. Instead, they want to live close. So neighborhoods that used to be riddled with gang activity are now being replaced with expensive condos. Well, that means displacement for those people who've been living there, in many cases for generations. And it creates a challenge for them who have been walking to work. Now they're going to ride the bus, buy a car, where they're going to live. But John recognized this as an opportunity because he saw all those rich, young, urban progressives like their coffee, and they like good coffee. So he saw an opportunity for those people who were being displaced to have jobs and have an income. And so he started Portrait Coffee and actually resourced it from Africa as a way to be able to provide jobs for his people, good copy for the neighbors, and a great opportunity to use the word of God and see things happen. What was a problem for everyone else, he saw as an opportunity. He writes, when people who look like you respond to the changes and challenges in your neighborhood by creating opportunities for families like yours, that's a portrait of gospel love. Opening a business is an act of creation, a way we reflect the God who made the earth out of the void and who placed us there to cultivate it. With a mind and heart of Christ, enterprising believers recognize opportunities, take initiative, and do the tending work to help their projects grow. And you're like, John, some of you, your opportunity may be a business idea that's been lurking in the back of your mind. And maybe you've got some fear. Can I do it? Could it really succeed? But maybe it is even today, God and his Holy Spirit is gonna confirm in your heart, I've got you in this. I've called you to do this. You're not gonna be able to do it on your own, but the day is here and I am with you and you take the risk and you do your part and you're gonna see lives change. You're gonna see your business expand, your work for God's kingdom and, and things that you can do because you are accepting the Jesus opportunity in front of you. Are you wanting to do that? Do you wanna be a part of that? It means recognizing the opportunities. It means saying yes. It means moving forward. On well, verse eight, the man who had formerly been blind, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed it was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I can see. And I just wanna say that when you take advantage of the Jesus opportunity, not everybody's going to understand. Not everybody's going to be on board with you. There will be some who are skeptics, some who will stay in the blame mentality. But that doesn't mean you say no. That doesn't mean you don't go when Jesus calls you to. People ask, where is this man? And they ask him, and I don't know, he said. I don't know. You know, the man didn't understand everything about Jesus to experience Jesus' touch in his life. And you don't have to understand everything about Jesus to be a part of what he's going to do in and through you. Following him in obedience means you take what you do know about him. And can I tell you, he is a good God who loves you and offers the best for you. In fact, he offered himself for you. And the one who died on the cross so you and I could be forgiven is not done yet with you. He's going to continue to work in you as you recognize him, as you step forward in faith, as you seize those Jesus opportunities. But the people brought him to the Pharisees in verse 18, 13, the man who had been blind. And now on the day which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees asked him how he'd received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. They turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? He was he your eyes had opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe he had been blind. The one who had been blind had received his sight. So they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. 
Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can now see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Look at this verse. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is age, of age, ask him. You know what that means? His parents cared more about what other people thought about them than they cared about what had just happened to their son that totally changed his life. Is that crazy? I don't know about you, but any, any parents in the room? Wouldn't you want, if your kid had been born blind and never seen, wouldn't you be celebrating? Yeah. Yeah. Yet how many of us get so caught up in social exception, acceptance and, and wanting to be approved of by others that we fail to let the work of God be seen in us, that we fail to let his light shine in us and we don't get to experience all that God has for us and we don't get to celebrate what he has done. You know, at Southeastern University, I have the privilege of teaching at all levels, undergraduate masters, doctoral class, and you know, our undergrads on campus, we'll often get together with lunch and coffee for them. And I love their stories. Love to hear their stories. You know, most have come from very supportive Christian homes, but it amazes me how many found Christ in high school through a youth ministry. Got a call to ministry and know they're called to ministry. And their parents are like, you're doing what? You're going to be broke your whole life being a pastor. What do you mean you're doing that? Why don't you go and become a lawyer or a business person or something? No, I'm not going to pay for your education. But these young people know we've got a call in their life. They know God has called them to ministry, maybe going to Anchorage. And they're saying, I am willing to do what God's called me to do even if I have to pay my own way, even after I have to figure out how I'm going to do that, find the scholarship, find the resources, even without my parents' support. Sometimes, sometimes following Jesus means we have to say goodbye to some other people in our lives. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I told you already you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now that was probably sarcastic. I don't think they were interested in becoming that, but you know when God has done something in your life, you should invite others to become his disciples too. It's part of what allowing God's works to be seen in us is about. We share that. We get that word out there. It was what, 21 years ago in Hawaii, a Jesus opportunity came by. Pastor and Pastor Luis and Ruth's life said, I see an opportunity in Seattle. Would you guys come? You had to make a choice. There was a risk, but it was a Jesus opportunity. And you came here and you started first in a very small gathering, just a few people, and you didn't let that discourage you. You kept going and you moved from one building to another till you wound up in a theater, till you wound up where I got to be with you over at South Center Mall. Isn't that cool to have a church in a mall? And there were people were there and the church had grown, 400 people gathering together, but that wasn't enough. You saw another Jesus opportunity to do house churches that could be meeting all over the area. And then now you see another opportunity in the city of Anchorage, 30,000 Filipinos, no assembly of God church there in the area. And is it easy? No. But are you doing it anyway? Yes. Why? Because it's a Jesus opportunity. And as Jesus is opening the doors, as the hope of the city is here, as the testimony of the life-changing work of Jesus, many thousands of people will hear of the good news of Jesus there in Anchorage as you guys go forward because you are seizing the opportunity. You are not sitting around looking for someone to blame. This is not an op a problem. This is an opportunity. Now, verse 25, 28, excuse me. They hurled insults at the man and said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. This man answered, 
Now, this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Do you hear how this man's faith is growing even as he's reflecting? The more he talks from, from not knowing, not knowing, now he's understanding this man is from God. He's coming to a place where his relationship with Jesus is about to change dramatically. And yet, it also comes at a price. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. That doesn't mean they just threw him out of the room. That means they kicked him out of the synagogue, the place of social acceptance for a Jew of the first century. He was kicked out by them. But notice, it doesn't end there. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, Jesus heard, Jesus saw it. His community had kicked him out. Those people whose acceptance his parents sacrificed supporting him for said, we don't want you anymore. But Jesus heard, Jesus found him. Jesus came to him and he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? This is the question, the greatest question for any person to ever answer. Who is he? The man asked. Tell me that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believed. And he worshiped him. Worship is something you only did to God. This is a great evidence for the deity of Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man and coming there. But it also shows us this man understood the greatest question of any of us can answer. The right answer is, I believe in Jesus. Because when we believe in Jesus, we experience forgiveness. We experience eternal life. We experience his presence in our life. And those Jesus opportunities will open for us as we move forward. So as we get ready to wrap up, just invite you to stand to your feet. We worship this morning. Incredible worship team. Such a joy to worship with you. Love, love the passion and the excellence. You know, worship itself comes from the old English worth ship. Apply worth to the one who is worth it all, worth more than anything else, worth more than we ever have. And belief and worship go together when we come to Jesus and understand that he is the one, the only one who can turn those problems into incredible opportunities. Can meet us where we are, forgive us of the wrongs we've done and bring us eternal life. So as we close out this morning, if you're here today and you've not yet come to that place of believing in him, I want to invite everyone to just close your eyes and bow your heads for just a minute. And you would say, I need you, Jesus. I need to know the forgiveness. I want to respond like this man who had been born blind but then saw, did in belief and worship. I believe you. I worship you. I give you my life. Is that the case for you? Would you raise your hand? Anyone? I see the hand. The others. Next, if you're here and you've been one, you've been caught up in the blame game. You've seen your problems as, as something that cannot change. And you use them as excuses to just hold you back. And you hold bitterness in your heart towards somebody you blame for your problem, your situation. But you're ready to change that. You're ready to forgive those who've hurt you. Whether they meant to hurt you or not is not the point. You forgive them because you don't want to blame anymore. You instead want to turn and see those problems as opportunities. And that's the way you'd like to respond today. I invite you to raise your hand. Anyone here? Several hands going up. Next, if you're here and there is a Jesus opportunity that's been stirring in your heart and maybe the Holy Spirit's just, again, renewing a vision and you've been holding back for whatever reason and yet Jesus is here. He's to say, you know, I've got you in this. I'm calling you to go. 
You may have some mud on your eyes for a while, but you're about ready to see if you step out in faith. And like the team's getting ready to go to Anchorage and move and leave everything they know behind here in Seattle, go to a new state, a new culture, a new climate, but they're doing it in faith. What is yours? What is your Jesus opportunity that's in front of you? Maybe it's sharing your faith with the work, uh, some of you work with this week. Maybe it is starting a business. Maybe it's starting an advanced degree. Maybe it's proposing to that person you've been dating just a little bit too long and it's time to go to the next step. Whatever it is, whatever it is, If you've got a Jesus opportunity in front of you and you just want to close today by saying, just Jesus, I hear your voice. You're telling me to go and I'm going to go. I'm going to be sent, Lord. I'm doing this. I'm doing this because it is day and I'm going to do the works of him who sent you while it is day. We're going to let the works of God be seen in us. And I want to do this. If that's you, would you raise your hand? And Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this incredible church and these these people that you love, Lord. I can just sense the love of Jesus when we walked in the door here, God. And and Lord, I know that you have so much in store for hope of the city as a church as they take this new step forward. And Lord, I pray that you would provide the right place for them as they gather there and the right opportunity, the right strategy for marketing, even conversations. And Lord, that there would be thousands of people who would find you as Savior and Lord there in Anchorage. But Lord, also the growth would continue here in Seattle, that there would be more house churches that would be born here, that you would bless and you would continue to raise up those who have the call of God on their lives here at this church. But Lord, I know there are also other Jesus opportunities that are being birthed around this church. And I pray, God, you would give those you are speaking to do the courage to step out, to do what you have called them to do. And Father, would you do it in the name of Jesus, that you would be glorified, that your works would be seen in them, that all of our faith could grow and this world could be changed to the glory of God. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.